Welcome to the McMillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkshire, host, and our guest is Anthony Acciavati, an Agrarian Studies Program Fellow at the McMillan Center. He is a historian of science and technology with training in architecture and cartography. Today we'll talk with him about his award-winning first book, Ganges Water Machine, Designing New India's Ancient River. It's the first atlas that's been done on the basin in more than half a century and based on a decade of fieldwork and archival research. Welcome, Professor Achiavati. Thank you for having me, Marilyn. Let's start with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Sure. So the book is uh, an, a history of the Ganges River Basin told through uh, the history of its infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in terms of its infrastructure going from canals to privately owned bore wells and how those interface with growth in population density and the capriciousness of the monsoons. Mm -hmm. So the book is really structured in four parts. The first part is really a kind of survey of the Ganges. So why is the Ganges so important? Uh, what is its importance within the context of India uh, with respect to Hinduism, uh, with respect to uh, empire and imperialism? Uh, and the uh, and the kind of environmental conditions of the basin. The second part is really about how this river basin has been transformed to one of the most highly engineered landscapes on the planet. Mm -hmm. So really, how does the Ganges water machine come about? How does this landscape get turned into a giant water machine from the 19th century uh, all the way up to the 20th century? And then the third part of the book is looking at the decentralization of water infrastructure that takes place, especially at the early during the early 20th century, and explodes during the second half of the, the 20th century and, and through today. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth part is what I call a dynamic atlas, which is a combination of uh, an atlas and an almanac where I'm not just trying to uh, map out uh, space, say, as a static condition of here's a building, here's a landscape, but also how does this landscape change periodically with the monsoon? So really mapping the choreography of water and people, bringing all of those infrastructural, cultural, and environmental layers mm -hmm. all together to give a dynamic sense of the basin. That sounds like a huge undertaking. Um, and I'm curious, what led you to the project? Well, it's a, I would say it's a mixture of uh, academic interests and autobiographical. Uh, I grew up uh, not far from the Mississippi River, lived for a time in New Orleans, and also in Rome, Italy, and I just always had a, a romance uh, with rivers and cities. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted, after I graduated from college, to really study a river in depth and, and a set of cities. And so I was scanning, well, what rivers and cities have not really been looked at very carefully, and I came across the Ganges, and the Ganges River just uh, blew me away in terms of its population density, one of the most densely populated river basins in the world agriculturally extremely productive, undergoes radical changes every year with the monsoons, and yet hadn't been mapped in about half a century. And having just come out of architecture school, I wrote a Fulbright proposal saying, for me as an architect, it would be fascinating to map what does this area look like? How do people adapt to the monsoons? And how might we develop new ways of visualizing this landscape so that it's not just about words and numbers, but also uh, giving a sense of measure to the mm -hmm. slow motion changes and the fast paced changes that are happening here. So I wrote a Fulbright proposal before Google Earth was launched. Uh, to, to undertake this kind of madcap adventure where I said I had to go out and walk the land and do my own surveying. And much to my surprise, I got the Fulbright to do it. And I thought I could do it in a year, but it took me about 10 years to wow, do the whole wow. project. So I am curious, um, during, uh, the landscape must change dramatically during the monsoon season. So were you there during the, both during the monsoon season and then not during the monsoon season. I'm curious about your methodology about how that actually worked and also how much, you know, miles, how many miles did you cover in doing this? Well, so I was there for uh, monsoon, pre-monsoon, post-monsoon. Okay. So as a Fulbright Fellow, I stayed one full year. Okay. And I really used that year as a, as a kind of datum to map out these changes that happen in the basin. So I would keep going back to the same areas uh, across, the, across the river basin to map it 
not just cartographically, but also photographically. So mm -hmm. I would combine cartography and photography together so you could see both in a, in a more traditional cartographic sense, how do rivers and, and surface water bodies expand and contract mm -hmm. both horizontally and vertically, but also how do people change their habits of living in these environments as they change. So definitely the monsoons in a way were almost like a kind of clock or calendar that mm -hmm. I used to measure and map this space out over time. And then uh, I ultimately went back and forth over the course of 10 years, uh, 23 times, to do all of this mapping. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the area that I covered, I mean, I walked and boated about um, 1,800 kilometers of the length of the river. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's not just following the line, which of course uh, zigzags a lot, but also crossing it, because trying to really understand not just the river as two banks with water flowing in it, but really understanding the larger river basin or the watershed, how mm -hmm. that ties into the Himalayas, how those uh, Himalayan rivers like the Ganges and the Yamuna River are very much fed by the monsoons. So how does the monsoon not just uh, uh, water this area, but pull over a billion tons of silt down the river basin wow. every year? Mm -hmm. So really trying to map out at a kind of almost global scale those weather patterns all the way down to an urban, regional scale to even soil structures themselves. Right, right. I mean, it just strikes me as a huge undertaking. I am curious, how, how, do, you, how do you measure the water itself. I mean, so that's, that's how is a, that done? That's a great question. <laughs> um, well, you know, I got to India and I was hoping that I could find some maps. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, I can't find any maps here in the U.S. Google Earth, very low resolution. So I was hoping I would get there and I could find some maps, but I could never find any. And in fact, when I would ask, I'd also oftentimes be asked if I worked for the CIA. And of course, I said, you know, no, I, I did not that I think somebody who worked for the CIA would say they did. But uh, I never got to see any contemporary maps because mm -hmm. uh, none really existed. And the, and the data on water flow back when I first started this work in 2005 was very scant from the government. Mm -hmm. So I really had to use methods from geology and, and uh, hydrography and then also uh, develop my own instruments and mm -hmm. techniques and uh, guerrilla tactics of mapping okay. uh, the spaces and developing instruments for mapping soils and their movement across the basin. And do you have any idea of why no maps had been made, you know, during the, the 50 year period? Well, you know, uh, in the book I speculate as to why that might not be the case. And so the Survey of India is the government body that's supposed to be mapping um, these areas uh, periodically for the government. But I speculate in the book that maybe one of the reasons they haven't mapped this area for such a long time is it's so it, it's changing so rapidly. Uh, the monsoons dra dramatically change it just every year in terms mm -hmm. of the landscape. Population growth is extreme. Just in the state of Uttar Pradesh that I lived in, uh, it's 200 million people living in an area half the size of California. Mm -hmm. So it'd be the seventh most populous country in the world. So traditions of cartography, of representation of these static maps fail to capture the dynamism and the and the change that's happening in this landscape. So I suspect that's maybe why they haven't mapped right, it in right. such a long it's time. It's kind of tough to do. It's yes. like a moving target. Exactly. Okay, I know you probably had several adventures over the course of the decade that you were working on this project. So give us some of the highlights. Tell us some stories. Sure. Uh, I mean, I would say some of the most uh, amazing stories were boating along the river. Um, the uh, oftentimes riding with boatmen down the river in various segments, seeing freshwater dolphins was quite amazing for mm -hmm. someone like me coming um, from the United States. Uh, I think kind of seeing a glacier lodged in the side of, uh, of the Himalayas and, and it having this kind of burnished emerald city kind of hue glowing mm -hmm. about it from indirect sunlight was really just kind of nothing sort of extraordinary. Uh, and I certainly had quite a few adventures in terms of run-ins with uh, people. Probably the, the, the most colorful one was uh, I was out mapping very early on uh, a canal that's fed by the Ganges. And uh, I was with a driver and we were driving along and at a certain point he stopped and refused to go any further and explained to me why that there were dacoits or bandits in the area. So I, thinking that he was um, kind of just didn't want to go any further. I got out, walked a, you know, a kilometer or two, and then as I was getting ready to do a set of photographs, three women were approaching me, and I didn't think much of it, but at a certain point, they whipped out um, 
machine guns as they got about, you know. Oh my goodness. Three, three meters or so uh, around me and I dropped my camera, put my hands up and I had, you know, still learning Hindi at the time. So the first thing that came out of my mouth was I said, in Hindi, your country is very beautiful. <laughs> and they looked at each other and looked at me and then they all three started laughing and two of them lowered their guns and they were asking me what I was doing there and I explained I was mapping the Ganges. They said, but this isn't the Ganges. I said, yes, but this is Ganges water flowing uh, through here. And they ultimately let me go. I didn't know what, I, I think they didn't know what I was doing there as much as I didn't know what they were doing mm -hmm. there. But that was certainly one of the most colorful experiences right, that right. I had. Very interesting. Um, in the beginning of our conversation, you were talking about, um, you know, how the Ganges is important to India. Let's talk about some of those reasons. Sure. Well, certainly uh, the Ganges or the Ganga is very important to India uh, in terms of, of Hinduism. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a sacred river. Uh, some would describe it as, as a deity. And it's a sacred river that, is mar that has uh, incredible terrestrial sites that are imbued with celestial significance, which okay. is to say that certain important events have happened in these areas, say in the Ramayana, the, Ramayana, the Mahabharata, but also uh, there's a kind of topographic monumentality that inscribes uh, significance. So say where uh, two rivers meet, a, a confluence, mm -hmm. or uh, a kind of sacred site or river uh, or city uh, at an auspicious bend in the river. Um, it's, it's a site that is inscribed with so many meanings and layers uh, at a kind of religious and I would say a cultural level. And it's also a river that is oftentimes identified as being very much Indian and that millions of people survive um, in terms of their water for, for drinking, for mm -hmm. agriculture, for industry. Um, so it, it, it oftentimes, I think, both in India and abroad, uh, holds a certain a privileged place within the imagination of mm -hmm. both Indians and non-Indians as to right, what right. constitutes right. India. Given that importance, I know um, you recently, I think a, a year or so ago, uh, wrote an op-ed that was in the New York Times about the Ganges and how there is a water crisis, a, a shortage actually. So can you talk a little about you know, what the situation is today? Certainly. So, uh, you know, the, that op-ed in the New York Times is drawn from part three of my book that really looks at the rise of decentralization of mm -hmm. water infrastructure. And one of the things that I discovered from mapping the Ganges by foot and by boat is the hundreds of thousands, if, and estimates run as high as 20 million privately owned bore wells or tube wells exist in the basin. And they're not just for farming that we usually think of as being so important for the green revolution of the 60s and 70s, but many people living in cities draw up their own groundwater instead of relying on the municipality because the municipality either can't provide enough water or it's not clean or any number of issues. So many people take it upon themselves, almost kind of like wildcatters, to drill their own uh, bore wells. And it's a completely unregulated economy. So okay. there are many people that are overdrawing. So the monsoons are not able to replenish those aquifers fast enough. So there's this kind of tragedy of the commons where people are extracting the resource faster than it can be replenished. I see. And so in that op-ed, I describe this Ganges water crisis as really uh, coming out of the, the process of decentralization of mm -hmm. water infrastructure. And uh, what do you think needs to happen in India to, to prevent this, the shortage of water since millions and millions of people depend on it? So I think, you know, it would be very hard to go out and literally map all of those tube wells because one, that's an almost impossible task. It's like trying to plow the sea. And also there are uh, so many people who don't want you to know that I have a tube well. So really what I had proposed in the op-ed in the New York Times was developing models of development for all new development that happens that really takes into account where your groundwater comes from mm -hmm. and the amount of area that you leave open for recharge of that aquifer. So thinking of planning not so much as being purely in three dimensions, but also taking into account time, so adding that fourth dimension. So how do we recharge groundwater for the, uh, with m waters from the monsoons to support agriculture, but also just the incredible urban growth that's happening all across yes. India? Exponential growth, actually. Yes. Um, so where do you see the Ganges in 50 years, for instance? Well, as somebody who, uh, as a historian, I'm always wary of being a futurist mm -hmm. because I know how often futurists are wrong. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not going to, um, I guess, give a sense of where I, where I imagine it sh could go. But I, in, in an ideal situation, it would be great to see India uh, taking on the, the water crises, the environmental changes, along with the population growth, uh, 
really experimenting and thinking of it as a laboratory to develop a new set of soft infrastructures. Uh, and by soft infrastructures, I mean infrastructures that don't require a lot of electricity uh, or uh, hard infrastructures like pipes, but instead, say, bioswales and wetlands that really take into account and deal with the dynamism of, of, of the basin in terms of the runoff of pollution into mm -hmm. nalas or drains, uh, and developing economies around those and also new uh, planning procedures, uh, not thinking of infrastructure as being monofunctional, so not thinking of a canal as literally just moving water, mm -hmm. but how does that tie in to railways, to roadways, to development? So how do you laminate infrastructures and not think of them as being monofunctional? Right. I'm curious, with the work that you've done, and, and since it is so new and, and nothing else out there is like it, have you contacted any of, you know, the governmental officials in India to say, hey, you know, this is work that I've been doing. I mean, are there any plans afoot to try and um, uh, lessen the effects of the shortage of water? in India today? Uh, there certainly are uh, plans and the World Bank has loaned India a billion and a half dollars to okay. clean up the, the Ganga or the Ganges mm -hmm. River. Uh, and that really requires uh, maps of the basin which you know uh, hadn't really been produced for a very long time. So I've met with members of the government uh, about the, the maps that I've developed and how those could be useful mm -hmm. for moving forward with some of their plans of, of cleaning up the Ganga and, and really uh, making it um, explicit, not just in what I say, but in the maps that I show how this is as much a kind of urban and agricultural set of issues mm -hmm. as it is a kind of environmental remediation mm -hmm. program. So it has to be a, a larger synthetic project would be my argument right, right. of taking into account all of these other constituencies and, 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 and conditions as opposed to really just thinking about how do you take the pollution out of the right, water. Right. And are they receptive to those ideas? They've definitely been very receptive. Uh, I think that it's always tricky um, coming, you know, uh, at it from a, a, a long, a long, a long-term view uh, versus the way in which I think a lot of members of government and politicians operate, which is in the, you know, in an election cycle as mm -hmm. opposed to a five or ten-year plan. So I think a lot of times they're in search of a silver bullet that will fix these things. Yeah. But it took a long time to get the way that it has, and I think it will also take, of course, a long time to try to uh, make improvements to mm -hmm. it. So that might happen at a piecemeal level. Uh, but I'm hopeful, I remain hopeful, that it might be holistically tackled by the government and, and various um, uh, national uh, and state government and also non-government organizations. Right, right, hopefully that will happen. So while you're here at Yale, I know you're um, working on a project. Um, does it tie into this? Um, what, what are your next steps? Definitely. So uh, the work that I'm doing here at Yale is working on my, on my next book and an exhibition that looks at the history of village India, really from independence all the way through the kind of middle um, uh, to late period of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And I, came I, I became very interested in the history of villages in India because having walked so much of the Ganges, I was always amazed by the amount of, village, of, of just the actually density of villages that existed here. And it's oftentimes been uh, historicized uh, as a series of failed projects to develop villages. Um, and I was very interested in uh, how uh, the, the, the issues surrounding villages were very much tied to environmental questions of how do you develop better agriculture, sanitation, um, uh, how do you improve the larger environment, not just physically but also socially. And that was very much tied to a lot of the work that I started to study with the history of tube wells and decentralization mm -hmm. in India. So my next book is looking at the history of decentralization and village India, and then a series of exhibitions that look at the modes of trying to develop pedagogy, visual pedagogy, for villagers in India during uh, the Cold War to try to teach them or persuade them on how to make improvements to their villages mm -hmm. to be part of a larger decentralized nation building project. Okay, excellent. We will look forward to that uh, new book coming out. Okay, Thanks. thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. For more information about Professor Achiavati and his work, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. <laughs>